let's 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 get it going let's get started let's get started i'm excited Um, to be i know (laughs) same here same here i was just sitting down like reading your bio i was like oh i've never read her bio um and all of these (laughs) things that like i kind of knew just like naturally from from the moment that we started talking i was like oh what why we feel like family already like you know everything that you 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 brought up um your analysis your views were so like kindred to my own and so um you know from the moment we started talking i was just like oh i want to work with her in some capacity and so um it's good to to continue to be able to do work with you um so i'll start and i'll say just a little bit so thank you all for like joining our um our ig live for men healing this is this is a, a new and exciting um, initiative for us, and we're going to be doing these IG Live videos every week uh, for the next 12 weeks um, as a part of our goal to raise $90,000 in 90 days, um, really with the intentions of creating space and opportunity for male survivors um, to have access to the services that Men Healing offers. And so Men Healing um, provides services to men who've experienced sexual abuse or sexual violence um, ages 18 and older, um, whether they've experienced it as a child or as an adult. Um, And since 2001, Men Healing has served 1,650 men um, over the course of like over 80 um, weekends of retreats or uh, the day of retreat, which are like the retreat centers or day of recovery, excuse me, or the weekend of recovery. Uh, which are essentially like healing retreats and spaces that are uh, created for men to f- establish community and heal together. Um, and Uma is also a facilitator. Um, so I want to just introduce Dr. Uma Dorn, who is um, a facilitator, but also directing the evaluation project for men healing. Um, like I was saying earlier, when I first met Uma, like, I felt like it was Kendrick. Um, her analysis is so spot on. She had a powerful po- uh, power analysis, a racial analysis, um, and just really understood the impact of systemic oppression. Um, Uma is uh, has her PhD in counseling psychology, right? Uh huh. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> Uma, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go too much into it, um, but I want you to share a little bit about like your work, um, your research, and just like you know, what like brings you to the specific work and with the specific work of helping to serve male survivors of childhood sexual abuse and sexual sexual violence? Yeah, um, Richard, the kindred spirit part is, is mutual. I would say that was probably in my first, uh, our first retreat together. I was like, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're talking the same <laughs> stuff. So I'm really excited to be doing this work with you. Um, I would say my work really comes from probably my own personal experiences. Uh, I am a 1.5 generation uh, immigrant, right? So I've been in the U.S. since the age of 10 and really kind of having those experiences and and navigating them for me have been really, um, yeah, I would say shaping. It shaped my life and shaped who I am. And so for me, uh, a big part of all of my work has really been about how to make spaces more uh, a place of belonging for folks, mm-hmm. right? And to how do we do that, not just at the individual therapeutic level, but at that systemic level. And so for me, um, you know, a big part of working with Men Healing is that um, I believe that if we can work to heal um, mm-hmm. men, we can actually heal our larger systems. Mm-hmm. And, and so much of my work has been um, you know, working with uh, trauma survivors and uh, survivors of childhood sexual abuse, but mostly with mm. women. So this was like a new space for me to be able to say, if I can, if we can shape and change and heal men, we will also be healing women. And so for me, that's really a big part of why um, that that draw for me to work. Um, yeah, with, with men healing. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I dig that. I get that wholeheartedly. Um, yeah and um who better to have than you know someone like yourself who has a clinical background but really has that systems analysis to understand how the two interplay right the personal and the systemic 
and how that exacerbates the experience of trauma. Um, but, you know, one of the things that you said, like I read in your bio um, that really resonated with me, because um, I kind of feel the same way. And that's like, you said that you believe that everyone, you know, deserves, like has the potential to heal and to thrive. Mm -hmm. It's just certain environments um, are not conducive to healing and thriving. Right. Um, in actuality, I would add to that, like certain environments are actually harmful and traumatizing and like completely antithetical to healing they're doing the opposite um and yeah what do you what do you think Retra re -traumatizing. Re -traumatizing. <laughs> yeah so how do you think that that plays in like the role of environment plays in to the experience of sexual harm for men um and even just your work at men healing like what have you seen what would you like to see more of as it relates to those and I think a big part of, you know, our work in doing the research and program evaluation project is that we hear the voices of the participants who are saying, like, this is the first time I'm able to be in a space with other men and know that I'm not alone. Right. And I think um, that much of the narrative has left out men's experiences and voices in, in this. And so I think um you know from that extent like there's a systemic issue when we are leaving out people's voices and so how do we um you know kind of intentionally and purposefully create that so that they can yeah be able to feel like they are part of the the larger sexual survivor uh community you know and so um i mean oftentimes they're saying this is the first time i've said this to someone else um, and it's been like 40 plus years right and and that I've shared my story um, and often and I think the other part of it is I don't know as a community are we ready to hear their stories sometimes I wonder about that I think we have this perception especially if we think about from a toxic masculinity perspective right yeah. um, in some ways we may want not want to hear yeah, yeah absolutely um, Right before this, I had a chance to talk to one of my cousins um, who's actually been incarcerated for 30 years. Um, and, you know, I, I remember when his life, like, it kind of spiraled after the loss of his mother and some of the things that he experienced afterwards, the traumatizing things that he experienced afterwards, and the role that that played in his decisions that led to a situation like that. I mean, obviously coupled with an environment that was intentionally targeting black and brown communities, you know, with this effort to massively incarcerate black and brown people um, in the spirit of capitalism and an exploitation of black and brown trauma. Um, but like talking to him today was just like, you know, as someone who's also formerly incarcerated, who's been there, who like, I didn't have a space to like talk about my trauma, um, specifically not about the trauma of sexual abuse, like that was like for, forbidden, right? For men to talk about it because, you know, even early on, we internalize these notions of masculinity that says that we, you know, as boys, as males, uh, you know, we're supposed to be able to protect ourselves and defend ourselves from any harm, even if you're five years right. old. And if something happens to you, if a violation happens to you, then that means that you failed as a man, even as a child, we learn that, you know? Right, well, and I think we also, you know, put that expectation on men as women. Like for me, I could say that, you know, I think there's that expectation of wanting, because I think there's a fear, right? If, if we think about men being sexually victimized, is that, what does that mean for me too? Like, I think there's that uh, unintentional fear that's there. Yeah. So yeah, I do. And I think the layer of all of this is, you were talking about black and brown folks, right? What does it mean for in, in for those in that intersection of that identity? Like, what does that mean to, to name that this has happened, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the other thing I wanted to ask you about too, like one of the things that came up and, you know, I. I you know, I, I, I heard it um, when I was at the um, at the weekend of retreat in Alta, Utah, which was beautiful. Thank you so much. You did a fantastic job mm -hmm. of facilitating. 
Um, and, you know, you just bring so much energy in your spirit, you know, of compassion, of love to the space. Because, you know, if you ask me, like, so much of this work is work that's rooted in, it's heart-based work, you know? It's rooted in love, you know? It's rooted in a desire to, to, to really create a space that allows people to heal, that frees them from judgment and the shame that keeps us in bondage and keeps us isolated and alienated. Um, but one of the things that you said that also kind of ties into this is, um, and, you know, Jim has said it, other folks have said it, um, but could you share a little bit more about like this idea of transitioning or just like adding this, this kind of shift from post-traumatic stress disorder to post-traumatic injury? And what do you think that does and how was that, would that impact like black and brown folks? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, if we think about mental health as a mm -hmm. whole and the way that we've been kind of doing treatment, mm -hmm. I think it's still really rooted in white supremacy, right? It is, I mean, if we think about just the spectrum of diagnosing medical model and, and just in terms of how do we approach healing as a whole, I think it's still very much um, connected to that. And so in, in dismantling that, I think part of it is also mm -hmm. our languaging around this. And when we think about post-traumatic stress disorder, I mean, you think about the word disorder, mm -hmm. there's something mm -hmm. wrong with me, right? Um, and so there's this assumption that I'm broken and can never be healed. And, and for me, this idea of injury really shifts that thinking from something is wrong with me to something happened to me. Mm. Right? So mm. allowing that space for much like the things, you know, when something, when I'm injured, I have a wound, but that, but that can heal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that this is something that can happen rather than there's something wrong with me. And I think there's so much shame around sexual violence that um, the disorder becomes internalized. And if we, when we use that terminology, and so the shift to injury really kind of allows for much more holistic mm -hmm. and less self-blaming uh, mm -hmm. perspective. So if you, let's say you were talking to like, you know, I'm sure like therapists are going to hear this, social workers clinical mm -hmm. folks like you know like how, what type of advice would you give them in order to like kind of like start practicing that or thinking about it in this way um because it's it's a big shift right there's like insurance purposes of using disorder right that um so what would you say to those folks who are listening to this and then saying like hey this makes a lot of sense um but i'm working for this organization or this agency that's requiring this how would they be able to like manage the two yeah i think it's i mean but i think it goes back to like systemic things i think we should be advocating for it to be mm -hmm. changed in the dsm i think we should be trying to really push for mm -hmm. that so i think there's one part of that but i think it's also how we approach our treatment mm -hmm. i also you know again when we think about the larger treatment of mental health it's really kind of uh set up to be where i'm the expert mm -hmm. There's something wrong with you, let me fix you, right? We kind of think about it very simplified. But what what if we kind of move and approach it more from something happened to you, you have in you the ability to heal mm -hmm. and let me support you in that process, right? In much the same way with a wound, you know, to put some cream on it and a Band-Aid, but ultimately it's the body that does the healing. Yeah. Um, and we're there to, to kind of help, help you know, be there through that process. So I think in that same way, I would really encourage um, providers to think about like um, helping, I think shifting that language because language does mean a lot um, in how we approach it and, and reducing some of the shame that is already innate in, in, in sexual trauma. Yeah, absolutely. And I just also think about like, you know, just the historical pathologizing of black and brown trauma responses in general, right? especially when you think about like, you know, that was like a major shift in like the trauma research and trauma work, right? That there's nothing wrong with you, something happened to you. And if mm -hmm. you, you think about, if we think about, and just consider the historical like um, impact of, of racism and white supremacy on black and brown folks that have been told yes. <laughs> for the longest that, that there was something inherently wrong with us right mm -hmm. 
our skin was our sin that made us right. inferior, that made us subhuman, that made us deserving of all of these like inhumane, you know, uh, terrible acts of violence. Um, and so that in itself is something that we are already struggling with, feeling like there is right. something wrong with us just because of our blackness and our brownness, right? And then you couple that with an experience of like interpersonal trauma, direct trauma, like, and then now they're adding even more layers and levels of, you know, pathology, but also thinking about it, like in the way that it relates to uh, pathologizing black trauma responses, brown trauma responses that ultimately get criminalized. Right. And then people right. are punished for being wounded. And so it's not just like something that's happening internally, and this goes back to you know your analysis, and we know that now there's this systemic component to it, where it's like not only is black and brown trauma being um, you know pathologized, and there's something being being told that something is wrong with you, now it's being criminalized. So we know that a lot of the behaviors that people are engaging in, right, in communities and the, the environments that do the opposite of healing but promote harm people are responding to them right because of these systemic mm -hmm. forces and oppression in a way that their trauma responses is produced and then their trauma responses are labeled deviant abnormal mm -hmm. yeah. and then criminal yeah. and then yeah. they're incarcerated and so like last week jim and i had a chance to talk to some therapists out and uh, I want to say Utah, and that was one of the things that we talked about. It's like, you know, when other folks, you know, when white men experience trauma, not to say that, that their experience, because we know men in general, right, there's a lack of resources and services for men in general who are survivors of violence, and especially survivors of sexual violence and trauma and abuse. Um, but just hearing like them say that, yeah, I went through these struggles, I struggled with this substance abuse issue, and then finally, I got it right because I got into a treatment program that allowed me to get me on my feet. And I'm saying to myself this whole time, like, I ended up in prison. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think you can separate that, right? I think that's the other part of it. You can't separate the racial trauma because that is that there's an added layer to that. And, and like you said, the consequences of being black and brown and having your trauma response not seen in the same way. Um, and, and that starts really early, right? When we think about it, even in the schools, <laughs> I mean, it starts so early where um, it is punished in ways that I think um, that, that we don't think about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's what, you know, my, you know, the research for my, you know, my, uh, one of my, the study I did for my doctoral program is like, asking school social workers what their experiences like serving male survivors uh, of color. And, and it was very obvious and it was very clear and they were very sad about the fact that they hadn't even checked their internalized racism. And these were like black and brown social workers working in a school setting and just like they fell victim to it. It was like, I didn't check for him as a survivor of sexual abuse. But with the girls I did, but for with him, you know, it was like, oh, let me call in the disciplinary person to like get this kid to behave, right? And manage this crisis or get them out. And we think about this as it relates to the school to prison pipeline and like how these kids who are experiencing trauma are not being viewed as vulnerable and susceptible to exposure to trauma, but their behaviors are being viewed as consistent with the racist ideas of being more aggressive and more violent and all of these things that racism has, you know, perpetuated about, especially black boys and black men. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, I think that's the thing. I think we need to really be working towards, um, not just, uh, you know, again, creating spaces mm -hmm. for, for this, this conversation, but allowing for like, how do we think about the, like, really dismantling some of these larger ways of kind of operating, right? Um, if, if we move immediately 
and look at a trauma response as deviant rather than um, approaching it from a trauma trauma informed mm -hmm. place, then then we're going to continue to re perpetuate trauma, and it adds another layer of trauma mm -hmm. that we can't ever kind of uncover. Yeah, know? yeah. Well, um, I mean, we have some good news, right? And that's what this whole yeah. initiative is about, right? <laughs> because uh, yeah. Uma and I are working really hard, and several other members, Kit and Kirby, um, of, of Men Healing, are working really hard to like make sure that the healing support services are accessible for black and brown survivors, right? Yes, that is yeah. what we're trying to do. <laughs> yes, right, and that's been something you've been pushing for the longest. Could you talk about that? Like, what are your thoughts and feelings about yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of what we know, and I don't think this is new to, to kind of this work, is that, um, you know, I think much like the larger therapy services that we offer, a lot of times the expectation is for people to show up to our mm -hmm. doors, right? We want people to come to us and be willing to kind of engage mm -hmm. in services. And, and I think what we know is that um, if the likelihood of that happening is very low, right? I mean, the trust in systems, yeah. um, given the harm that's already been done, done, right? The harm that already exists in these systems, the idea of someone saying, okay, let me go in and try to try to test this out to see whether I'm gonna take the risk of being harmed again doesn't make sense. So I think for us, what we are really shifting to is this idea of how do we go to communities that invite us to come, mm -hmm. right? That's the other mm -hmm. part of it. Like not just show up and say, hey, we know what we're doing. Let's, we have this great thing, let's do it, right? More um, asking for permission to, to enter communities and to do it in a way that really, um, you know, meets the needs mm -hmm. rather than kind of assuming that, again, really centering it on this idea that they have, that, that black and brown communities have had and have ways of healing that have that have existed yes. and, and let's continue to kind of, um, you, know, you know, like enrich mm -hmm. that, right? And so that's, that's, that feels like really important. Um, yeah, way. and there's been some other shifts with men healing too, like as, as far as like, you know, the um, lived experiences of the facilitators, their analysis, their perspective, you know, their race, their gender. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, Yeah, I can. And I would say so a lot of my, uh, I do some, I do a lot of consulting work in the diversity, equity, inclusion space, which I don't love that language. I, I really like, I talk about belonging and equity mm. in my work. I'm and take so, a note on that. But in that. I'll quote you. I'll <laughs> cite you. <laughs> and I think, I think the big part of what we know is a lot of organizations are work, I mean, I think have come to a new awakening um this past year after george floyd brianna taylor um you know um and i think really wanting to do intentional work i will argue that men healing has been <laughs> trying to do this even mm -hmm. before then um and has been really intentional about that and a lot of times there's a lot of talk mm -hmm. in organizations but then the, the reality of it doesn't happen and i would say men healing has really been been intentional about doing that um, I actually started yeah. off on the board <laughs> when I first started with the organization uh, for a couple of years, and and even in the time that I've been on the board, it's it's shifted from a predominantly white board to a predominantly BIPOC mm -hmm. uh, board, you know, and so really kind of making that shift there, I think, is important. Um, and it's not just about like having representation, right? right? What do right. we do after we that after that happens? Right? And so, are we making intentional? policy changes? Are we making intentional changes in terms of how um, we support, um, not just, you know, in terms of the, the community of folks we want to serve, but the, the, the BIPOC community within, within the staff and, and the board too. And I think that has really been intentional in the organization. And, and similarly, I, I feel like the facilitator team has really been shifting in that direction. Um, there's a white accountability group that meets regularly and really is looking to kind of um, you know, dismantle their own biases mm -hmm. and, and try to try to really be uh, intentional about that. So I think, um, yeah, I feel really excited mm -hmm. because I think uh, it isn't just a rush of, hey, we really want to serve communities of color. Let's just go do it. But let's make sure we're doing that with a lot of 
um, yeah, well thought out intention and that making sure when we are there, we're representing the community in not just, again, numbers, but in, in our thought mm -hmm. and our actions yeah. too. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, my very existence and like being a part of Lynn Healing, is that right? As an anti-social, anti-racism anti consultant <laughs> for um, Healing. Right. I said anti <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, but, but I've seen it and, you know, I, I, I also can attest to that too, that commitment, that, that intentionality about making sure that perspective thoughts, uh, are being included in this process and not only just being included, leading the process too, you know, right. um, right. which is, you know, cause like you said, sometimes it's just, it's just like sprinkling some, you know, mm -hmm. you know color on an agency. And then that's not really representing or reflecting like the the vision, the ideology, the approach to the work um, of that particular agency. Um, and also we know that this is hard work too, right? Um, yes. Like these, these are some hard conversations that I've been a part of. I'm sure you've been part of a part of many of them um, where we're like really talking candidly. And I think that's one of the things that's oftentimes intimidating for folks when they think about um, really kind of making that shift and honoring um, the true impact of diversity, right? Where it comes mm -hmm. with an added sense of value based on unique and different experiences that can allow us to come up with better solutions to problems, more ways to heal so that everyone can have access to it. Um, and I think people get shy away from like the really tough and hard conversations that a lot of times are um, rooted in a lot of anger. You know, you're talking about anger that has come from years of suppressing and not expressing that even extends beyond our existence, right? That lives right. in our body. Right. Um, and so those are very hard conversations. And, you know, I applaud Men Healing. That's part of the reason why, you know, I decided to stay on working with Men Healing because of that commitment, because of that investment, because of people like you um being there and being so committed to that um and that's why it's also really important um for those who are watching to like you know donate to us because you know ninety thousand dollars is not a lot of money um but what that ninety thousand dollars will allow us to do it will allow us to provide support to a hundred men and in the form of 13 different like uh, weekends of recovery um and we are very intentional about making sure that money doesn't become a barrier to anyone who wants to access these healing services. Like Uma said, like everyone deserves to heal and everyone has the ability to heal. Um, it's just those environments that are not always conducive, but men healing is definitely one that's intentional about being conducive in a variety of ways to the healing journey of men. Um, and this intentional effort to really make it more accessible to men of color it's something that will be supported by the money that you donate. Um, so, you know, we, we are grateful for your attention to this, this conversation, um, being present, um, but we would also love if you can donate anything um, towards this. I wish I had to like market to indicate like how much we've raised thus far, but I think we've been doing pretty good. Do you know? We have. I do not know. <laughs> I do not know. But but I I also echo what you just said. I mean, I think the big part of you know, uh, you know, a big a, a big thing to note that a lot of our facilitators are putting in volunteer yeah. time to yeah. do the work that we do, and so that this is this is something we really believe in and believe in in finding a space for healing for folks. And so, um, you know, I think uh, how do we like. The money really goes to support, um, you know, folks getting the healing that they need, right. and which I think is yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. The money's not going to pay for people's salaries; it's right. going directly to pay for people's access, which is amazing. Right. Um, you know, and you know, one of the things that Jim says, um, the founder and ED, like, is that, and I agree, and I've heard this before, is that um, Men Hill is also not trying to be the the empire. They're not empire builders; they're movement builders. And in that, in that vein, it's like Men Healing is also looking to partner and work and learn from other organizations that are serving men of color. So, you know, if you're unable to donate, but if you're an organization that's already serving and working with um, male survivors of color, 
who are experiencing different forms of trauma, as we just talked about earlier, like, unfortunately, there's like a, 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 a tremendous amount of ways that we experience trauma, whether it's race based, whether it's proximity, whether it's police, you know, we experience a tremendous amount of trauma in addition to our sexual assault and, and violence. Right. And so if you're interested in like learning more, connecting, you know, advising us, you know, giving us some, some ideas on how we can best engage, please reach out, you know, um, you'll be able to find more information on our website. This video is going to be recorded. It's recorded and it's going to be on our website. Um, we have a ton of videos on the website also sharing um, from, you'll hear from other survivors who are talking about their experience, uh, their healing experience. And that's something that Men Healing is really committed to. And that's the, that's the biggest shift that I've, I've sensed. And I know that um, has dri driven the work is to just really emphasize the importance of healing, the, the, the possibility of healing and share those stories so that people know that they're not alone, they're not the sum total of their trauma, they don't have a disorder, they've been injured, right. something happened to you, but you know, you can get through this with the right environment, with the right people, and I think we can we can help. So Great. I, I definitely do. All right. Uma, anything you wanna say? What's the last words? What last words you wanna say? You know, I think I think, I think you just summed that up. I think it's the stories of, of our survivors, right? It's it's in their, and in their journey mm -hmm. of healing that we can find mm -hmm. hope, right? Um, I think a, a lot of times we get stuck in the story of the trauma, but it's the story of the healing that I feel like um, that where men healing is different and where we want to offer that to more folks. Right. Thank you, Uma. Thank you, Richard. Have a good evening. All right. Thank you all for listening. Coming in. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.